Well, we again have the great good fortune of having you, Lee, with us. Uh, I did my research and it was 2004 when we saw you last time. Uh, most of you are already well familiar with Lee Hartwell, um, director and president of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And among his awards are the 2001 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, Albert Lasker Basic Medical Research Award, the Gardner Foundation International Award, the Alfred P. Sloan Award in Cancer Research, and so on. So uh, uh, Lee did a lot of work earlier in his career on genetics, which led to uh, the discovery of checkpoint genes, which was an important part of the story of how uh, replication accuracy is maintained as DNA reproduces itself. Uh, welcome. Thank Glad you. to have you with us. Pleasure to be here. You, you feel increasingly like a part of the family here. Very happy to have you. Um, when you were here last time, uh, we were talking about a global program, I think, in, in uh, cancer discovery and cure, and particularly in uh, protein work, using proteins and imaging uh, to try to get to first stage uh, detection, which was the highest, of course, the highest uh, of the five stages in terms of being able to cure cancer. Uh, uh, if we kind of flip that and say, you know, is that working? Where are we now? Uh, is, there, is there too much hype and, and not enough action? And how, how do you feel about g genomic research in general on that score? Can you kind of bring us, bring us forward from where, where we were last time? Okay, well, it's a, it's a, it's a big topic. <laughs> um, but uh, let me just start off by saying probably what I said last time I was here, which is that um, coming from a basic science perspective, what I'm, uh, what's motivating me is that we seem to know a lot about biology from a basic science point of view, but have had relatively little impact on medicine. And so why is that? And, and we actually see a lot of things failing when they, you'd think they'd be succeeding now. We see huge um, prevention trials which turned out to have the wrong hypothesis. Uh, we've seen um, the pharmaceutical industry um, having a very hard time making effective drugs despite uh, you know, increasing costs, probably reaching over a you know, billion dollars a year. Um, so what's, what's wrong mm -hmm. with the whole system? And also the huge increase in, in health care costs that are unsustainable. Um, so to, to try to simplify things, I, I think there, there is a fundamental answer that will change medicine, um, and that's basically molecular diagnostics. That uh, there's you know, enormous amounts of information in our bodies by the complexity of the molecules that are circulating around, uh, whether they be DNA, RNA, or protein. And, uh, you know, if you look at any, and I've been doing quite a bit of this, is um, not just cancer, but all diseases, you know, what is it that um, a, a patient and a doctor want to know about disease? And, you know, there's a half a dozen questions. You know, it has to do with, you know, what's my risk for disease? Um, do I am I am I in the early stages of a disease? Because as you mentioned, for for cancer, but really for all diseases, if you catch them early, uh, the costs of managing them and the morbidity are greatly reduced. Um, so, uh, if you can't prevent early detection. Um, what type of disease does a patient have? Because you know, even for uh, you know a particular type of cancer, you find a half a dozen types within that type. You've got to match that. What therapy matches that disease? You know, is the therapy working in real time? Uh, whether than just waiting to see whether the patient lives or dies, and. Um, you know, is there, um, once a patient has been effectively treated, you know, is there disease recurrence? And uh, what we're seeing is that in, in cancers leading the way because there are DNA changes in cancer and very good technology for following those changes, 
that we're seeing more and more molecular information integrated into cancer management. Um, and in some cases, like chronic myelogenous leukemia, we have excellent markers to follow the disease progression through its whole course. But for most diseases, for most uh, conditions, we can't answer any of those questions very precisely. Mm -hmm. So that's our need, more information. So when you say markers, these are, these are molecules of some kind that are ejected, essentially. They're in, in the bloodstream. They're available for some kind of a survey. And you can detect them in, in a process that uh, before death that allows you to diagnose and treat uh, to the actual subset of cancer that you're looking for. Well, that's the, that's the goal, that's and at the present time, most of the effective molecular markers that are used in cancer management are obtained by biopsying mm -hmm. the tissue yeah. okay. and monitoring them. So and they're not blood-based, they're, blood <clears throat> they're tissue-based. Yeah, yeah. And, and so you have to know the cancer's there, you have to know where it is, you have to go in and invasively uh, biopsy it. Now if you but have to know the cancer's there, that's, we're already losing, right? That's right. That, so that's not effective for early detection. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But it does show the tremendous uh, resolution and value of having molecular information. Yes. Um, and what we need to do, as you just implied, is get that information out of readily accessible body fluids right. like blood. And that's where the action is. And I think the action is, is largely in the protein area because proteins are the molecules that are much uh, more uh, closely involved in function and much more dynamic. Um, and um, in the last, uh, and so I've been involved for the last five, seven years or so in, in essentially promoting this field and trying to get funding for it, getting good labs right. going. And th there's been quite a bit of progress in the last two years and I'm pretty encouraged. We, we had uh, Craig Venner here last year as an opening night uh, speaker. And his general approach in life, I think, is what he, the shotgun approach. You get a million computers and 5,000 buckets and whatever, you know, whatever you're doing today, multiply it by 5 million and go forward. Um, is that the kind of effort that's needed here? If we have this, this many questions to ask about, this many proteins, this many diseases, this many subsets of cancer types, it, should we be taking people up and, and grinding them up in, in the millions and then putting them into test tubes? And, if you know what I'm saying? Is there some very massive uh, study that's needed instead of this kind of person-by-person -person thing? Is, is, is this a moment when we should be doing tens of thousands of, of, or millions of people? Well, it, it, it is a, um, exactly that type of thing because um, uh, we, 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 don't, we don't have any real um, uh, theory or knowledge base to say what protein is going to be a good diagnostic marker. So it's very empirical. Mm -hmm. And so that's exactly what is happening is actually for small numbers of patients with a well-defined disease, looking for proteins in the blood that distinguish the diseased person from the normal person. Um, and that is what we call shotgun proteomics, mm -hmm. where we're looking at, at thousands of proteins to look for those fundamental differences. Right, and that's for each disease. For each disease has to be done so differently. So you multiply that out, you're into the big numbers probably. Well, yes, and then, you know, also uh, the discovery of markers is, you know, small numbers of patients, but the validation of those markers is thousands of patients. Mm -hmm. So we are talking big numbers. We are talking big numbers. Yeah. Is that underway, or is that, is that a program that's in your own vision and that you want to achieve, or where is that? Oh, it's well underway. Uh, there are a variety of uh, discovery efforts and academic laboratories working in a variety of diseases. And in fact, um, I'm encouraged enough in just the last year or so of the results that are coming out that I, I think it's certain that we will have effective biomarkers for disease, that there will be an effective pipeline for discovery. So what I'm really worried about now is the, f the subsequent steps. Mm -hmm. After you have valid biomarkers, there's a very long process of getting those into patient management and many ways to fail along the way. And I think we're seeing that failure right now in the DNA diagnostic field where there are thousands of DNA tests you can have, 
not very many of them will actually be of use to you. Uh, but they're being offered to the public, they're being marketed, and, um, and they haven't been validated. Mm -hmm. okay? And this is the problem, for example, with PSA testing for prostate cancer, where it was a, a test approved for disease recurrence, but has been used for early detection. Mm -hmm. But it's not validated. And what it means is that we don't know how many of the people we detect don't really have disease that would progress, and how many people who have disease we don't detect. And that's not been studied any, anywhere? Well, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of data that indicates the numbers are very big. That is, there are lots of false positives, and, and probably only mm -hmm. a small percentage of the people who actually get treated need to be treated. Yeah. And there's a lot of people we miss because PSA yeah, isn't yeah. always there when there's prostate cancer. So we have to do this validation part. And the big challenge is that um, the return on investment for diagnostics is quite small compared to therapeutics. And yet mm -hmm. the amount of investment needed to do the validation is almost the same. Mm -hmm. You need large, large trials. And so, uh, We've really been working on finding a new model other than going to a venture capital and going to a company and trying to do it uh, through the commercial route. Right. That, 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 let's call that the traditional route, the pharmaceutical budget route. Mm -hmm. some, some guy in some city uh, looks at a budget and decides which things are most, most profitable, and basically that's how medicine goes forward. Uh, and that's why it gets more and more expensive. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> particularly in America. Yes. Uh, do, do we ever get to the point where we flip that and the patient is the customer? Do we ever get to the point, I, I was giving a talk recently and I, I mentioned, you know, if you're in medicine, and I don't mean this personally, but it, it, you know, it, it, if, if the patient dies, there's no, out, there's no penalty. In most, you know, in business, that's not true. But in medicine, you just go on and do the next thing. So. Yeah. Uh, when does the customer really become the patient? Yeah, well, uh, that's an excellent question, and, 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 and I tell you, I don't know the answer to the market dynamics there. Um, but I, I'll tell you who I think is the client for improving outcomes and reducing costs. And people really aren't talking about the, you know, how to really attack the cost question. But I think the client for this are the single-payer healthcare systems right. throughout the world. Yeah. Uh, the U.S. is not good in this because we have too many insurers and, um, and people move back and forth across insurers. But in most countries in the world, you have single-payer systems. And um, so we're starting to go to those single-payer systems. Can you just define that very briefly so people know what a single-payer yeah, in most countries, it's the government that pays the health care costs. And so uh, the Minister of Health is very interested in containing costs and, mm -hmm. and improving outcomes. Um, and f traditionally, um, the Ministry of Health has not been involved in research. Um, and they're just involved in delivery. But there really is no other client for reducing costs. Yeah. All the other clients you know, want to increase costs, yeah. right? And um, so we're trying to make the argument that... And you just described the American system. Yes, <laughs> yes. So we're trying to make the argument, and, and this is a group we've just formed called the Partnership for Personalized Medicine that involves um, uh, Tijan in Phoenix and uh, the Biodesign Institute in Phoenix and the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in uh, Seattle. Um, where uh, we make the argument that, you know, if you want knowledge-based medicine, uh, you're going to have to get proactive and create it yourselves because the marketplace is not going to deliver it. Mm -hmm. So let's go, let's rewind for a minute back to single payers. Uh, I just happened to know from our conversation last night that you've been active, pretty active about this. So you're, you're going to other countries, not the United States, uh, looking for an ear to help implement this exact kind of benefit and system. And without having to name the countries, th th this is your view, I think, of, of how to get this moving forward, is to find single-payer systems that are government-wide, country-wide, and get them implemented. Is that a fair statement? 
Yeah, that's correct. And, and, and what we want to do is a, a, a single project around a single disease in very large scale where we take advantage of the academic laboratory discoveries that have already been made and do a validation with the country. And what that involves is they have to get their clinical system up to speed in terms of electronic medical records, outcomes data, uh, being able to follow uh, patients through the system, and uh, being able to collect appropriate tissue samples and blood samples uh, and have a biorepository. So it's really turning the sort of standard healthcare system into a research mm -hmm. uh, entity and, uh, and do a decision tree of how the disease is managed, where all the decisions are made, and then an economic analysis of where in that decision tree there's an opportunity to improve outcomes and reduce costs. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., I know there's this term evidence, it's a relatively new term, Evidence-based medicine, which is chilling to any patient. You know, so <laughs> what was the one before, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if it wasn't evidence-based, or, or what, what is, was it? What is the one now? <laughs> yeah, what's the one this morning? Uh, good question. So, um, uh, and I know you're interested in this. And I, so, would you please describe evidence-based or performance outcome measurement healthcare uh, in the U.S.? I mean, I, th I think you're trying to do something like that here as part of this work in Arizona, and how do we do this in our own country? Well, I think, you know, the first thing we need are valid um, uh, indicators of um, where a patient is in their disease process and what they need, and that's what we're lacking in mm. almost all diseases. I mean, there are a few examples. For example, if, you know, you go to a hospital with chest pain, they'll test blood for uh, proteins called troponins, right. and um, and that's helpful. If you've got troponins in the blood, then you get you know uh, serious treatment. But um, we need a lot more of that, and uh, we need to be measuring thousands of things, not just a few mm -hmm. things. And so the the discovery and validation pro is the first part. It's going to take a decade to accumulate the kind of information that we need to really implement evidence-based medicine. The, the problem is that there just is not enough evidence now. Mm -hmm. And is there enough financial support for this to happen? Well, there isn't enough financial support. Um, if, if it's done, you know, mm -hmm. sort of the way it's going, what, what'll happen in the U.S. is that tests will get introduced to the public without validation. And we'll have you know, more, more bad than good. Mm -hmm. And so we do need the investment, and that's why we're going to the single-payer systems, you know, who are, you know, spending billions of dollars a year on health care. Yeah. And we're talking about programs that are, you know, $10 million to really do a in-depth study and validation. Right. This reminds me of the panel, the discussion with, with Bill Hazeltine yesterday where, our smartest people are going to India to find out how to do surgery at a, at a decent cost. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I, I wonder if, I, I worry a lot about, I mean the reason we call this thread broken healthcare, fixing healthcare, it's broken. And, and you said it so well just a minute ago, that the whole idea that all these people are in business to drive up costs. And I think that happens when there's a business model where the, where the customer is not the patient. Uh, do you, do you, and we had American Well here, one of our fire starters, trying to connect, directly connect the patient and the doctor. Is there a revolution? Well, I want to ask you a more focused question. What if General Electric, what if Jeff Immelt were sitting right there and he said, here's a chart of my medical costs for the last 10 years, it's driving me out of business. I'm, I'm losing my best people because I can't even afford to pay insurance anymore. Increasingly, they're, they're, they have to pay instead of me, and I, and I can't pay it either. The compound annual growth rate is crazy. It's my largest growth in costs. I'm going to be out of business in five years if I don't fix this. It's a true statement, essentially. So uh, we get him sitting right there, which we could probably do, and, and, and we say, Jeff, your budget is a billion dollars a year, or whatever the hell it is for, for currently. Take that money and make your own system or get together with Palmasano or somebody, and you and IBM do this together. Just, just start from nothing and build something that is informed and works 
and where the customer is the patient. <clears throat> Would that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, and I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, it, it's hard for the individual patient to have much of a force. Uh, there are advocacy groups and things that have some effect, but um, you're right, the companies, the big companies that are supporting the health care of their um, workers are, could be a tremendous force in the U.S. for change. And, and I don't think they need to, you know, go out and create a different system what they, they need is to, um, you know, work um, with the, the government and the federal system um, to create the right incentives, right, for reducing mm -hmm. costs. Mm -hmm. But that might be a different system. Well, yeah, it'll certainly be a different system to some extent. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, maybe we should try and do that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, good idea. <laughs> All right, I'm going to note to self <laughs> next year. Uh, okay, so meanwhile, uh, nine minutes. Uh, let's pretend that Jeff isn't sitting here and that we have to do this in some other way. Uh, is there something that people can do as individuals when they look for health care outcomes that are better? You know, you mentioned the PSA test, and, and I think the street feeling right now, every guy who's older than 50, I think, is supposed to get a start getting PSA tested in his life. But the, the street knowledge thing is just what you were worried about, right? They know what you know, basically, that, that uh, there are so many false positives, you don't know whether to believe the guy or not. A and, and you worry about the medical profession making this into a big money maker uh, at your expense. And, whether, and a lot of people talk to each other and say, watchful waiting may be the, may be the answer because it's such a slow growing thing anyway, uh, it, you know, if you're, and so on. Uh, but there's a lot of distrust there, and, and that's the last thing anybody needs. Yeah, I, I think that's a problem that, uh, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's certainly in the urologist's interest to treat you, um, and, um, uh, and, and that's something that we'd, we'd like to change. But uh, when there is effective information, then practice changes, and I think there will be information very soon uh, about uh, which prostate cancers are aggressive and mm -hmm. dangerous that need to be treated and mm -hmm. which ones can be left alone. So in that case, yeah. uh, is, there an is there an ethical issue here that, among doctors that needs to be addressed? I mean, you, you just mentioned this, well, you're, you're all just like to make more money. But uh, isn't there a problem? I I'll just give you one example. We had a case in our family where m multiple MRIs, every day, new MRI. I don't think these were being done based on need. I think they're being done either defensively for legal reasons or just to make money to pay for the MRI machine. That's how it felt. And um, there's, there's, I get a feeling there's a lot of that kind of stuff. Is this an ethical question? If you're, if you're a practicing physician and you're, you're charged with the care of this person, maybe you're not doing harm by doing one more MRI or ten more MRIs, but are you really, is that an ethical thing to do? Well, I mean, there, there certainly, the, the, you raised two important points. There certainly is an ethical I issue. I mean, there are a lot of, you know, doctors who have uh, very high ethical standards, but there are other doctors who are businessmen, and uh -huh. uh, they're out there to make money. Um, so that's part of the problem, and the, the incentive is to, to sell more. Um, but the other part of it you mentioned, I think, is a very important part in the U.S. that also doesn't exist in other countries, which is this you know, litigious side of things where uh, doctors are forced to do a lot of procedures purely uh, defensively. Yes. Yeah, and, and you know, that, that's crazy, that really is. To me, that seems like the unmeasured part of the, legal, of the lit litigious cost. Yes. Because, because when you do a study, you find out, doctors always say, uh, it's, this is a big problem. A and then you, you go into a study, you find out, no, it's not a big problem. The actual awards were very small. It Does, doesn't represent the amount of health care increased costs. It's not even close. It's a tiny, tiny fraction. But what they don't, I think, yeah, you're nodding. What, what I think they don't measure or can't measure is the extra 10 MRIs that were done Absolutely. It, as a defensive measure so that if you came in on, if something bad happens on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, you could show up with the evidence in court and say, on Tuesday we did an MRI and here it is. It's totally unnecessary testing except from a legal perspective. Yeah, I'm sure that's true, and, and, you know, and also on the diagnostic side of trying to get information about patients, the, the, the most effective uh, things we have now are, are in the imaging field. Mm -hmm. 
And um, I, I think what will happen as we get better molecular markers is that a much smaller number of patients will need to be imaged. So you will first, you always need to back it up, but you'll do the first, uh, you know, a molecular test and then find that, you know, 10% of the people are Instead needing of further is, work. Yeah, right. And th those will go to the more expensive imaging. Because mm -hmm. imaging is one of the, the most significant drivers of healthcare costs. Right, right. Yeah. But, but in today's system, it's the reason to image. You have an imaging machine, you have to pay for the machine, that's the reason to image. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, we have a, a few minutes left, and maybe we should try for questions and see if there are any. And if not, I've got 15 more. So. Other questions? Can't quite tell. It. Davin Usala, Infotech Research Group. Uh, I just had a question about, can about cancer and the role that... Uh, um, animal protein plays in that if, if there is one. I've read stuff and wondered what your opinion is. Uh, you're talking about diet and cancer. Um, uh, well, there's, um, there's you know, fairly consistent data that um, high protein diets increase the risk of colon cancer um, some percentage, 50%, twofold, something like that at the most. And, and it's primarily, that's the primary connection between um, uh, meat and, and, and cancer. But it, it's, it's, um, it, it's probably not a significant factor for many other cancers. We, we talked uh, last time you were here about this issue of uh, viral caused cancer. Of what? Vi cancer is caused by virus. Yes. And. Uh, I don't know what's happened since our last conversation, but I want to ask you the same question I asked you that time, which is uh, two, two parts. How many, no, how many, what percentage of all cancers roughly today are known to be caused by a virus? And what's your personal estimation of the actual number? Yeah, well, um, the terrific thing about finding a specific cause like like a virus for cancer is that you can eventually eliminate it. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so in the U.S., it's primarily uh, uh, cervical cancer that is known to be caused by papillomavirus. And as you're well aware, there's now a vaccine for that. And um, so terrific story of being able to prevent an important cancer. Uh, worldwide, um, but not so much in the U.S., uh, liver cancer is uh, caused by hepatitis virus and is a huge worldwide problem, especially in Asia. Um, and, and there, there are vaccines available too for mm -hmm. hepatitis B. And, um, and then gastric cancer is also um, uh, caused by bacterial infection and um, antibiotics can eliminate that. So these are the real success stories. And what you're uh, alluding to is you know, how about the other cancers? How about breast cancer, colon cancer, you know, prostate cancer, lung cancer? Um, are there viruses involved there? And the answer is possibly, mm -hmm. you know, and until somebody discovers a virus associated with the cancer and can do an epidemiological study and show that uh, it's very strongly associated, we won't know. But, um, you know, if, it, you know, viruses probably worldwide are causing, you know, 20, 30 percent of the world's cancers. Um, uh, why not the rest? Yeah. Certainly possible. Okay. Uh, chance for one more question, if we have any. All right. Well, I think we're we're good. And uh, one back is now. there one? Yeah, Chetan Sharma. I was curious uh, in your experience, what are one or two ways uh, that you have seen work uh, with respect to increasing the funding for research? Thanks. Um, yeah, so you're referring to the fact that uh, I'm sure that um, NIH support for medical research has been flat and even declining when you account for uh, inflation uh, and um, sort of a crisis in the medical research community um, because people have been trained when the budgets were increasing and now um, having a hard time getting funded. Uh, one encouraging thing is I think there are other sources of funds coming in. A lot of people are getting excited about what's happening in medical research. There are increasing activities and foundations, uh, uh, a lot more philanthropy in the U.S. that's getting involved in research. Uh, state governments, you know, California, big uh, $3 billion 
uh, thing for stem cell research. And I think as we can get more countries in the world um, in, involved in uh, collaborative research. Um, so that's what's encouraging to me. I think there are maybe other opportunities in addition to federal funding. And we should mention the Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Center, which also needs funding on a daily basis, uh, which you run, and uh, which probably I think was the first place to to be known for bone marrow transplants and uh, high leukemia cure rates and uh, as, as a world leader in all that stuff. So uh, stem cell research and pretty amazing uh, that you guys are leading all of us uh, forward. Yeah, the thing we're quite excited about at the Hutch in terms of therapy is immunotherapy mm -hmm. because uh, bone marrow transplantation cures a disseminated cancer. It's leukemia throughout the body uh, and it's doing it by an immune reaction. The donor cells are actually attacking the cancer cells. And that's led to a lot of research on how the immune system can cure cancer and uh, work that we're doing to try to further that so eventually we'll be able to vaccinate against all cancers. Mm -hmm. That's the hope. That would be great. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lee, for coming Pleasure. again. Really appreciate your help.